Hello, this is British astronaut Tim Peake and I know that you're soon to hear from John Vickers about the importance of water and nowhere is that more plain to see from space. When you look down from the International Space Station it's so clear to see that two-thirds of our planet is covered with water and how vital that has been to life on Earth. And of course life in space couldn't exist without water. We have to recycle about 90% of our water. That includes capturing our sweat, condensation and yes, drinking our own urine the following day. And of course we use water uh, for electrolysis to split into hydrogen and oxygen so it's vital for our atmosphere as well in order to be able to breathe. So enjoy your conversation with John and the importance of water. So a little bit of history first. Um, I grew up in the Middle East. Uh, from a very young age I learned to dive and duck dive under the water. Limited to probably 30 second uh, breath holding exploits uh, and very occasionally opened my eyes, you know, that stinging sensation of seawater. But I grew up with this as a very common image. Not necessarily these fine three young men, but uh, watching pearl divers go off in the dows in the morning uh, to dive off the, the coast of Bahrain perhaps down as deep as 20 or 30 meters holding their breath anywhere three four even five minutes long to bring up a number of oysters and perhaps with a few of those precious pearls inside the only equipment we ever saw them go with was besides themselves was a nose clip and a basket and that seemed to be the extent of the diving capability and i suspect if you ask most people uh, throughout history you know what would you ex expect of a diver this is the sort of image they'd conjure up with mostly men uh, very simple equipment at best perhaps uh, you know some simplistic goggles a nose clip something perhaps to collect uh, the goods that they found underwater sponges or pearls something to collect them in but it's actually not always been like that and it's not always been about men uh, it's not always been a benign environment underwater in in something like uh, 480 bc there was a greek couple uh, a father silius and his daughter hydna or cyana if you read some references uh, and again, the story varies, but they were a Greek couple, father and daughter, who were either em employed by the Greek army or captured by the Persians, but ended up in a very James Boss Bond-esque way, carrying out some espionage. And one night in 480 BC, they actually cut the um, Persian fleet that was moored off the coast of Greece, ready to invade. They cut the moorings and set the, the, the fleet adrift. Now what's telling in the depiction of the picture you can see is I, I presume that it's Silius at the top. He was a renowned um, strong swimmer and could hold his breath reputedly for a, an awfully long time underwater. And the depiction you can see, obviously somebody at the top is seemingly carrying out a swimming stroke, but I hope you can pick out that the figure in the bottom seems to be carrying what looks like a goat skin or something like that and is obviously very clearly breathing from it. This notion that um, diving, therefore, is a modern concept is actually something that's not physically true. Not only was this being carried out in 480 BC, but there are all sorts of records from written history, ancient Egypt, the Far East, of both men and women carrying out a number of water, uh, underwater activities. And that connection between underwater and space hopefully will become more apparent as we carry on. But diving on its own without uh, a capsule doesn't really fulfill the picture. And this 15th century manuscript depiction of Alexander the Great, the great Macedonian leader, who was ruler of most of the known world at the time. Um, now, why he chose to do this, uh, as opposed to point the finger at some subordinate, I don't know. But the, the picture seemingly depicts Alexander the Great in a glass barrel in 332 BC, off the coast of Egypt, at a place called Tyre seemingly doing either some fish counting or some reconnoitering prior to uh, attacking Egypt. Now, I wouldn't necessarily trust somebody in 21st century to, to construct a glass barrel that I'd be very happy going underwater in. He seemingly was. But you can obviously see the limitations. Uh, a glass barrel, fixed volume, pretty fragile substance, but he seemingly trusted it enough with his life uh, to go under underwater. The next image probably shows something that we're much more au fait with, much more modern looking uh, diving setup. The diver outside the water now, I probably would suggest that this image depicting somebody what, wearing what looks like a, a glass helmet is probably not accurate. But nevertheless, you get a sense of a fairly modern setup. It looks like a wooden barrel upturned. Uh, there's an operator inside. The diver is connected to the capsule with an umbilical cord. 
may not be so clear on this image, but the operator, the person sitting inside the diving bell has got a set of bellows, so he's able to keep the diver outside supplied with fresh air. And if you look to the right of the picture, it looks like a receptacle, which itself is connected by a hose to the capsule. And it seems that they understood a couple of hundred years ago that you would use the air up to supply the diver and, and the person inside the diving bell, but at the same time, be able to automatically replenish their air supply from a receptacle. That's a very modern concept, actually. And this other image shows uh, you know, a 21st century diving bell set up. There may well be a second person in that diving bell. The diver is still connected by an umbilical cord, but in this instance is no longer connected to the capsule, but is connected directly to the surface. And the umbilical cord now doesn't just deliver a, a breathing mixture, it delivers hot water and communication as well. He sat on a platform which is suspended from the diving um, bell so that he can either take rests or prepare equipment for um, future work. The diving suit, though, is something that's developed enormously compared to the, to the figure on the left. There's definitely no glass helmet anymore. But I, again, I would have brought to you to show you an example of something called a Kirby Morgan Super Light helmet, which is a modern equivalent of, of the examples we've seen so far. But the diving suit is something that has um, developed extensively, although perhaps we've come a little bit further than, than these two illustrations show. The chap on the left, it typically, typically be, became only men wearing a canvas suit, big heavy lead boots, and a lead plaque uh, plate around his chest, and a, and a solid brass helmet, all designed to make sure that he stayed underwater, but again, supplied from the surface with an umbilical cord, which kept the suit partially inflated to stop the compression uh, and kept him uh, breathing. Now, the, the figure on the right, the fine figure on the right, in what looks like a, a Robbie the Robot for the um, Art Deco age, if anybody's familiar with Robbie the Robot. I mean, this is the only image I've ever seen of this, and I suspect it looks, uh, well, it, it was as cumbersome underwater as it looks to have been on land. But the interesting thing you'll notice, uh, attached near the diver's head, a couple of lamps, and tellingly, he's now um, got articulation at his elbows, his hips, and his knees. Features that are absolutely pertinent to modern spacesuit. The only distinct difference you'll see in all the earlier images of space uh, uh, of diving suits that the diver's hands were free and, and able to operate. Even if, if he was wearing gloves, the diver had a fairly sort of dexterous dexterous use of of his fingers. But in the image on the right, the diver is completely cut off uh, and operates a set of claws from inside the suit. Okay, so while this talk of diving, when we're when we're ostensibly trying to link uh, the Earth uh, to space, well. Diving on Earth actually contains an awful lot of similarities to spacewalks. You may even think of them as diving in space. When you go on, uh, or if you're a commercial diver today, you typically, or if you're a recreational scuba diver, if you do a dive that's deep enough and for long enough, at the end of the dive, before you come back to the surface, you'll have to do some decompression. You'll have to get rid of the extra gas you absorb during the dive in order that when you get back to the surface, you're not going to suffer from something that we typically refer to as the bend. The same is true in modern uh, spacewalks, but they tend to do that dive operation in reverse. They do the decompression phase first. So the astronaut gets into the suit, puts on the helmet, and again, unlike earlier examples, they now go into an airlock and then breathe pure oxygen for up to two hours prior to commencing the spacewalk in order to flush as much nitrogen out of their body as possible. Because whilst the ISS is, can, is a sort of atmospheric pressure, pressure inside the spacesuit is much less and the risk of nitrogen coming out of saturation and causing a potential bend is obviously much higher. Hence the, the, the um, safety protocols that they go through. This is an example of what actually the very first spacewalk. It was a chap called Major General Alexei Leonov and there's a connection between him and I. And in 1965, in March, he became the very first human, obviously not to go into space, but to go into space when he carried out the very first spacewalk. I'm going to play a short clip and then talk a little bit about it afterwards. Let's hope that technically it works. I'll catch you on the other side. The road continues to develop the human being. In the Soviet Union, the first in history has been achieved the entry of the human being from the space space. These are a series of documentary images. 
Они сняты 18 марта 1965 года автоматической кинокамерой, установленной на борту космического корабля «Восход-2». Пилотирует корабль Павел Беляев. Вышел из корабля Алексей Леонов. Человек в межпланетном пространстве. И он живет, работает, улыбается. И значит, люди смогут стыковать корабли, монтировать орбитальные станции, пересаживаться с ракеты на ракету, выходить из аварийных ситуаций. Смелый и важный шаг совершен по пути к Луне. И первыми совершили его советские люди. Fascinating, wasn't it? It wasn't the um, simplest and, and most straightforward of endeavours. So Alexei only spent 12 minutes and nine seconds outside of the capsule. And at the end of that uh, 12 minutes and nine seconds, a bit longer than he was expecting to, he tried to get back into um, the, the capsule that he'd flown up in and he was unable to do so. The suit had expanded more than, than they had allowed for. And he actually had to, and it's very difficult in space, your fingers, uh, gloves don't work as dexterously as they do on, on Earth. But he managed to break a seal, release some of the gas inside his suit, close the seal, and then fought his way effectively back into the capsule. Uh, his average heartbeat during that 12 minutes and nine seconds seemingly never dropped below 170 beats a minute, and he lost a number of kilos worth of weight. So you can see that the diving experience, if, if it weren't for the slightly jerky footage uh, and the outline, obviously, of the Earth, you could probably convince some of them watching an underwater scene. Three months later, Colonel Ed White uh, became the first American to undertake uh, a spacewalk with what I think is some of the best uh, nomenclature in space lexicon that you can get. It isn't quite a space ray gun, but he was using a zip gun. So he managed to, to carry out a spacewalk for 20 minutes, uh, still attached to the capsule by an umbilical cord to give him his breathing mixture. And again, uh, uh, similar to a dive, but he was able to use the zip gun with compressed gas, you can see the two canisters, to move himself about a bit more effectively and controllably than Alexei did. Alexei seemed to flounder slightly. Uh, the first female spacewalk didn't take place for another 21 years when uh, Alan, uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, a Russian lady, carried out the first female spacewalk. She did so for three and a half uh, hours. But it was two Americans, really, in the US who made the sort of distinction between what was a floundering initial spacewalk for Alexei and what becomes now the much more disciplined activity you see, for instance, that Tim Peake undertook. Buzz Aldrin and a chap, uh, the last astronaut to walk on the moon, a guy called uh, Gene Cernan, who I was fortunate to meet, pioneered use of pools to carry out EVA, extravehicular activity training that the whole thing became much more disciplined and process-led. Everybody wanted to get in on the act. Here's our very own Tim Peake. It's going to be one of the best selfies ever. You can obviously, again, see the sort of correlation between the diving suit and the earlier Robert the Robot uh, uh, suit that we mentioned with the lamps. Now you can see that Tim's got uh, lighting and cameras on both sides of his helmet. The EMU, as it's called, extra mobility unit is a suit that's designed for, believe it or not, the Apollo era. So although the suits are slightly more modern than that, they're derived from Apollo era technology. They're slightly getting past their best. Uh, Tim Peake's spacewalk with a companion, Tim Copra, for NASA was supposed to last about six hours. And although they carried out all of their tasks, they had to cut it a bit short because Tim Copra's suit developed a leak. You can imagine drowning in space isn't the first thing that you'd probably think would be happening to you but similarly to, to potentially having an accident underwater, it becomes a very real, real and um, uh, situation you want to get out of as quickly as possible. So Tim and Tim managed a six hour spacewalk. But again, while this preparation for, for diving outside, an awful lot of uh, activities on the space station don't just take place within the ISS, but takes place outside. An awful lot of maintenance and, and um, preparatory work for experiments take place because astronauts are able to go outside and prepare um, equipment, etc. They do so because all astronauts, all train as, as divers first. Not all astronauts get to do spacewalks, but that love of the oceans is something that they all take with them. It becomes really apparent when you look at our Earth. Here you've got a planet with you know, an average ocean covering of between three and four kilometers and about a billion and a half kilometers cubed of water. 
you only need to go as far as Jupiter on one of its moons, Europa, though, and you get uh, uh, an object that's about a quarter of the size of Earth, but whose ocean we reckon to be up to 100 kilometers at average depth, with a crust of ice over the top and about 3 billion cubic kilometers of water. And we think that with tidal gravitational effect from, from its host planet, Jupiter, and from potentially an integral heat source within the moon, that there is a liquid subsurface ocean. And of course, we believe that, ocean, that, that life on Earth emanated from the oceans, and it's more than likely that there may well be some relatively primitive life on Europa. But water also has another feature. I mean, if we're going to go and explore Europa, and we'll be doing so in the oceans, uh, and if we're going to live here on Earth with an increasing population and climate change that's happening, we, we, we may well find ourselves um, living in cities like this. You may be able to see on the, on the center sort of pod that there are objects descending from the pod itself to an underwater. Now, whether they're aquaculture farms, or fish farms, or a mechanism for enabling people to get quick and easy access into the water, you could imagine this scene transposed onto uh, uh, you know, a solar body somewhere else in our galaxy. I would suggest that we've um, finally um, grown up with the idea that we need to take much more care of this precious resource water. It forms a fantastic link between how we're able to live and exist here on planet Earth, and it forms the medium which we use in order to prepare people to travel into space. But as this example is trying to also show, um, and ne the NASA astronauts and Western astronauts carry out, there is a, a, an old habitat that's effectively a, a cylinder that's off the coast of Florida that the astronauts use a bit like an underwater hotel. It's in about 20 meters of water and astronauts spend about two weeks preparing themselves using that as their base so they don't come up after every dive, they stay underwater for two weeks. What it does effectively, that water environment, is enable you to get used to wearing a suit and a helmet every time you want to go outside and the fact that you have to have a breathing mixture. It's that psychological pressure that that water induces. I think that there's sometimes missing from the imagery and the reconciliation between, look, we live on Earth, but we want to go and live somewhere else, and the fact that you need to be prepared to do so. People's propensity to want to go is, is high, but whether or not you're suitable probably only comes out when you realise that the psychological pressure of having to live cheek by jowl with other people for a number of weeks at a time in very cramped conditions and the sort of constraints of when you want to go outside means that it's probably less people that would be able to go. Anyway, hopefully you've got a sense of why water is so important to us, that there's far more connection between water here on Earth and space than you might have envisaged. But I would ask you the next time you're out by the ocean, walking on the river, you retain one other human characteristic and bring it back to the fore. And that's curiosity. The third astronaut with the Apollo 11 mission, a guy called Mike Collins, um, typified that for me when he really sort of portrayed this. It's human nature to stretch, to see, to go, to understand. Exploration is not a choice really, it's an imperative. If we remain curious and if we treat our water a bit better, hopefully we can remain as curious and exploratory a species as we have been for the last few thousand years for the next few thousand. Thank you very much.